Uh, today's message is entitled Invisible Chains. Yeah. Invisible Chains. Have y'all ever heard this concept? They took the chains off of our wrist and they took the chains off of our ankles and they took the chains from off of our neck but they left them on our minds. You ever hear that idea, that concept before? Brothers and sisters, let me share something with you. If I had to have chains on me, I would rather have the visible chain. At least I can see them. If I have a chain that only, and I'm looking at it, and it only allows me to open my arms this far, I can deal with that better than not being able to open my arms and don't know why. Because I don't see a chain there. I can deal with it better if I see chains on my ankles which is allowing me to only step a foot at a time than to look down and don't see any chains but yet I can't get anywhere. I can deal with it a little bit better if I know I got a chain around my neck tied to a post which is limiting my realm of movement than to not see a chain. And yet every time I try to get ahead, something keeps stopping me. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's the invisible chains that do more damage to us than the visible chains. What did not get on last week's tape was this paragraph I'm about to share with you now. And it's these words, Christianity has been the major religion of the Western world for almost 2,000 years. And yet the Western world has been the cause of all the most man-induced catastrophes in the world. World War I was started by Christians in which more than 20 million people died. World War II was started by Christians. Don't y'all believe that lie that the Japanese started World War II? The Japanese was responding to what the United States had done to them. The United States had put an embargo to block off their food supply because they wouldn't bow down to what the United States wanted. And over 16 million people died. Over 100,000 died in one day when Christians dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Christians were the people behind the Holy Inquisitions where millions of people who the Roman Catholic Church called heretics were burned at the stake under the hands of the Roman Catholic Church and, and this practice went on for over 600 years until the end of the 19th century. Christians were the people who carried out the African slave trade. Whereas many as 600 million Africans died over a period of 400 plus years. And guess what y'all is still going on today. The almost complete extinction of the indigenous people of three continents, North America, South America, and Oceania, meaning Australia and New Zealand, was carried out by Christians. Christians are responsible, believe it or not, for the pollution of the environment of the societies of the world which is causing millions of people to die worldwide prematurely. Christians created what is known as the human immunodeficiency virus in a military laboratory in Fort Detrick, Maryland 
under a project called MK Naomi, which has caused over a million people worldwide to die. And as I speak to you, over a billion people are presently infected. The list goes on and on, brothers and sisters, of the atrocities carried on in the world by people who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. What's wrong with that? Now, I'm, talking, I ain't talking about, I'm not talking about black folk. Because see, we are good-hearted people. I'm talking about the people who gave us that religion, who don't believe it themselves. I know they don't believe it. I'll tell you why they don't believe it. Because if they really believed it, they would have never put the chains around our necks. They would have never snatched us out of our motherland. If they really believed it, slave master wouldn't have raped that black slave woman. If they really believed it, they wouldn't have lynched those black men and women. If they really believed it, they would not have castrated over 300,000 black male slaves just to keep them from making babies. If they really believed that we are all one in Christ, they wouldn't have did that. I was talking to a brother, and, and when I put him on the spot and called his car, he said, well, brother, don't you know that we're all one in Christ? I said, doggone it, when did you realize that? He said, well, the Bible says in, that in, in, in Christ there is neither bond nor free. I said, well, did, that verse was in the Bible when y'all stole us out of Africa. Am I talking too hard? I'm, I'm, I'm picking up from where I left off last week. There is a unit of the United States military forces. It's called Special Forces. I want to quote to you the Special Forces prayer that they pray before going on an engagement. Thank you, Doc. And I quote to you, this is what our military men and Special Forces say before they go in and invade other lands. Almighty God, who art the author of liberty and the champion of the oppressed, hear our prayer. Grant us wisdom from thy mind, courage from thine heart, and protection by thine hand. It is for thee that we do battle, and to thee belongs the victor's crown. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What kind of sick pathological people who have as their agenda the decimation of other cultures and populations and want to include in their prayer, it is for thee that we do battle. Unless the God they're talking about is not really the almighty God. They even put those words in our national anthem. For it says, then conquer we must. For our cause it is just. I shared with you how the missionary campaign did such a job on messing us up. In 1701, white missionaries and slave masters realized that in order for their agenda for supremacy, what I just said? Supremacy. For supremacy and survival. To have any chance at all African slaves had 
to be converted to Christianity. Had to be. So guess what happened, people? In order to accomplish this, once they, once they realized what must be done, there was this group of people in London that created what is called, and write it down, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Lands. Write it down. Go verify. You know what I like? I, what I like love about y'all, y'all are getting to the place now when y'all write down stuff, y'all go home and get on the internet and check it out, and then you email me and let me know that you've seen it too. And I said, that's what I'm talking about. That, that's, don't, don't take my word for what I'm saying. Go see it for yourself. The society, check it out people, the society by the Church of England, the society for the propagation of the gospel. Now that sounds good, but when you understand that the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel had military support behind it, which meant if you don't confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're going to kill you. It kind of changes the picture there, doesn't it? Slaves got to the place, y'all, to where they had to pray in secret. And I'll tell you why they did this. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I wish that we had the wisdom today that our great-grandparents had when they were in slavery. I'm going to show y'all something today. It's going to be deep how they survived. The African slaves never accepted this whole concept of Jesus and Christianity that the white slave master gave. They never accepted that. The African slaves never gave up what their genetic memory bank was attached to. But they had to survive. What they did is when they would pray, they prayed to the God of their spirit. And they would ask God to liberate them. Mm -hmm. They wasn't asking God to take me to heaven. Mm -hmm. No, they would ask God to liberate them from their owners. And they reinterpreted white Christianity by adding some of their own African spirituality into it. Yeah. Yeah. Slaves identified with the Old Testament story of the Hebrew children enslaved. Yeah. They identified with that because their attitude was if God could liberate these slaves in the Bible, this story that they're telling us about, then God can also liberate us yes. from this oppression that we are now under. Yes. Yes. You see, that was how they survived. So through, now notice how I'm saying this, through their intellectual arrangement of God and Jesus. Did y'all hear how I said that? Through their intellectual arrangement of God and Jesus, slaves were able to obtain a new meaning in their everyday life. Y'all have heard of Denmark Gussie before, haven't you? I told y'all about him in one of my previous messages. And Nat Turner, the black prophet, who was going around killing white slave masters because the Lord spoke to him and said, go kill them. Y'all don't hear that part about Nat Turner, do you? As the news of Denmark Vesey and his conspiracy broke in 1822 and, and word spread about the rebellion of Nat Turner in 1831, white folk became fearful. They realized that these slaves ain't really listening to this stuff we're saying about Jesus. Because if they was really listening, if they was really listening to turn the other cheek, Nat Turner wouldn't be killing folk. Uh -huh. If they were really listening to pray for those who oppress you, they didn't, didn't, didn't write slave owners and wouldn't be dying. So they're not really listening. So afraid for their lives and their investments in the civil peace and the preservation of the South's way of life. I like the way they say things. Whites demanded that legislation be passed 
to curtail the rights of Africans to assemble and have worship. Yeah. They passed laws to stop the slaves from learning how to read and write. And to do much more. At the same time, this fear and anxiety was producing an outpouring of concern to make Christians of the slaves in the hope that they might learn to turn the other cheek. Yeah. See, if you Christianize a person good enough, you don't have to worry about them going upside your head when you mistreat them. You understand what I'm saying? Because a part of the indoctrination of Christianization is pray for those who mistreat you. That's why, see, see, it's, you know, it's deep people when, when we have powers that be that can come up in our community and just kill our young people. I listen to some of that stuff when they bring the news cameras in. The, you know, you, you, this, this cop or, 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 or some other organization or entity was just responsible for snuffing out the life of my baby. And you say, but I don't feel bad toward them. I'm putting them in the hands of Jesus. Y'all know you've heard that, haven't you? That's some serious programming. When you can kill somebody's child and they've been so Christianized that they don't want to take your head off. That ain't the African way. See, the African way was an eye for an eye. Real simple. And the crime rate was much less. In the early decades of the 19th century, Christianity had made little or no inroads among blacks for fear that they might take literally such stories like the Exodus. And they, the slave masters felt that if these slaves picked this stuff up too much, they might try to have an exodus out of the plantation. See what I'm saying? So as this crisis of fear spread across the South, they had to develop evangelistic endeavors, particularly on large plantations to truly Christianize the slaves. Y'all with me? Now mind how this works. Preachers, uh -uh, urged them to fill up the galleries and, and made even special seating arrangement for select slaves. Make them feel special. Make them feel welcome. Of course, these were the house Negroes. You see what I'm saying? The house Negroes had become so domesticated, hate to say it that way, it sounds like I'm talking about a dog or a cat. But they become so domesticated and so domiciled that they could sit in the church with their masters while their cousin was hanging from the branch of a tree. Y'all see how powerful this thing is when I'm trying to get y'all to see it? Slave holder, and by the way, there was a large popular slave home holder who was a preacher. His name was Reverend Charles C. Jones. And Charles Jones developed a curriculum for slaves to instill teachings into them that were designed to prevent revolution and to serve as preventative measures in any insurrection. 
In other words, brothers and sisters, the underlying premise for evangelizing the slaves was a concern for safety of white folk. Did y'all hear what I said? And guess what? It has worked quite well. You know why? Because the only people we kill is our own. I'm going to say this, and I hope you don't mistake what I'm about to say, but when asked the question, why don't black folk kill white folk, the answer to the question is, we ain't never been taught to kill white folk. Truth, now don't get me wrong, I ain't saying that I don't want nobody here to go kill no white person. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, why is it that white people can still right now today kill us without any problem? Because they've been taught to do that. Many of them grew up watching how to do that. And don't get into this thing like Malcolm say, don't get dumb black folk to my father forgive them for they know not what they do. Hell, they know what they're doing. They've been doing it long enough. They know exactly what they're doing. My father forgive them for they know not what they do. Now that's some programming or what, y'all? Although the Africans were, let me let me show you how how African slaves got through this people. The Africans world before even coming here as slaves, and let me be sure you understand that, because see, there were Africans here before the white man brought Africans as slaves. There were Africans in North America, South America, you understand? Because we, we had pretty much circumnavigated the globe long before the white man knew what a boat was. So we had already been to other continents, because there are structures there, right? There are pyramids and massive structures of, 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 of Africoid features on other continents besides Africa yes. that predate the Atlantic slave trade. Right. So Africans always had a plurality of powers in their spirituality, uh -huh. Uh -huh. including the forces of nature yes. Yes. and legions of ancestral spirits yes. Most tribes believed in a supreme being yes, who was viewed as the creator, yes. the giver of rain, yes. giver of sunshine, the all-seeing one, the one who existed or self-existed all by him or herself. Yes. More than that, the traditional African spirituality, check this people, made no distinction between the sacred and the secular. The actual Africans did not do that. All of life, not just part of life, but all of life was sacred in the ancient African customs. Nor was there any sense of a division between this life and the next one to come. All of life was a part of one big continuum in which both the living and the dead took part in the mind of Africans. So long before our ancestors made contact with white folk, we were a strong and deeply spiritual people. During the early history of slavery, the African spirituality was seen by whites as a pagan faith. Notice how I said that. White folk had the audacity to call the African slaves' spirituality pagan and heathen. Us deep people. Their rituals and dogmas became described as voodoo. Hoodoo. For those who didn't know how to say voodoo, witchcraft and superstitions. And you know what's really sad about it? We have Africans today, black folk, 
who have become so Christianized and so Europeanized that you'll look at another one of your own people who because they're dressed up in African attire, first thing jump in your mind is they must be practicing voodoo. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Don't, don't, don't let a, 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 another African have on some beads or some shells or, 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 or items that connects them to their culture and their motherland because we Europeanize black folk who out white, out white people don't trust our own kind on sight. Mm, that's some deep stuff. Now listen, I was there. I'm not telling you what I, I'm not making up. I, like I said last week, the same dog that bit you bit me. Same dog. Racism. So you got to understand, brothers and sisters, white folk did not, nor do they now, have a spirituality. See, what white people call doctrine uh-huh. is supposed to be their spirituality. Right. Black folk didn't have doctrine. They just lived in harmony with creation. They lived in harmony with their environment. They didn't need a, a, a sheep telling them how to live. Uh-huh. Had to check this out to see, can I do this? <laughs> oh, shucks, I can't do it. There it is right there in the fifth paragraph. I can't, no, I can't do that. So because I don't do that, I'm spirit filled. <laughs> Isn't that deep, brothers and sisters? And that's the mentality that was put into us. As long as we're fulfilling a doctrinal code or standard, then we feel like we're okay. That's not the African way, brothers and sisters. Africans were quick to adopt the prevailing and forced, and I do say again, forced white evangelical culture. Dominations such as, there's this church called Episcopalian. Y'all ever hear that church before? Well, see, the Episcopalian church and the Presbyterian church were too strict. So the slaves didn't gravitate to their approach. There were other two churches that the slaves kind of felt a little bit more comfortable with was the Methodist church and the Baptist church. Both blacks, I'm sorry, but blacks also bequeathed something back to the evangelical tradition. There's a whole lot of evidence that suggests that some white folk even copied certain practice from black worshipers. Told y'all about uh, uh, Mr. Fox, the the progenitor of the Quakers, went to Africa and saw them in their tribal ritual during their moment of possession and when they would shake, you know, well, he got a kick out of that. So he went back to England and he told them when God is speaking and ministering to you that you will quake. <laughs> and hence they got this organization, this group of people called the Quakers. It has nothing to do with doctrine. That whole concept of quaking comes from quaking, you know, <laughs> period. And see what's deep about it is a lot of us feel that we're deep if we do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, y'all know, you, you know, and, and, and like I said last week, we don't do that nowhere but a church. <laughs> if you're going to quake, quake somewhere else <laughs> and see how long you last. I dare you to quake on your job. I dare you to. <laughs> Walk into your boss's office and, and, and quake for him. <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> doing this morning? So what's wrong with you? Sit in your cubicle and just quake and see what happens. 
Better yet, go for that job interview. You think that's so powerful? Sit in front of that interviewer, and when he asks you a question, quake, Charlie, and see how much success you have. We don't do that nowhere else, but we come here. It's okay, I'm not saying don't do it. What I am saying, though, is don't try to duplicate somebody else's practice. Just because you see somebody. See, a lot of us do stuff that we grew up watching. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yes. I remember one time I went to pray for this lady, and I went to put my hand on her head, and I hadn't even touched her. We just reached up. She watched Benny Hinn so much. I reached up to touch her. She started falling back. I said, catch her. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. See, she had already convinced herself that's what she's supposed to do. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I had that happen in one, one another situation. You know, it, again, people, we do what we see. Because, see, if it was really the Spirit of God at work, it would hit everybody. You have to agree with what I'm saying. But, see, I don't believe that the Spirit of God works a certain way with one person and not everybody else. In other words, when you jump in water, I don't care who you are, you won't get wet. You know why? Because that's the nature of water. If you get in fire, you're going to get burned. I don't care who you are because fire burns. Okay? You know, and we get into this thing of, of doing what we've seen done. I went to pray for this sister in another situation. I ain't never had brother fall out. Come think of it. All the years of my ministry, I never had a brother to fall out. It was always the sisters. Why is that? You know? And uh, Benny Hinn got him laying out, though. So I went to pray for the sister, and, you know, I guess she thought somebody was behind her <laughs> to catch her. And she just went on back just as nice, straight back, like, I mean, like a board, stiff. Boom, boom. And she hit her head on the pew as a, on, a, on, a, on a way down. And you know how when a person is hurt, but they can't let you know they hurt? <laughs> you ever seen that? And when she hit the floor, she said, Whoo! 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 I wanted to say, get up. You know you in pain. Go rub your head. That's what I wanted to say, you know? I saw it when she hit her head. I knew she was hurt. Her mind completely left the law. Yeah. All the stuff that goes on in church, people. I know it sounds comical, but it happens. Even though Africans shared much in part with their white counterparts, they held their own services. Yes, yes. They added their own African flavor to the white religious programming and legacy. In so doing, they created what I call an invisible institution, a church that was their own. Even today, it still exists. Nobody has church like black folk do. Y'all hear what I'm saying? White folk don't know how. White folk can't Right, you know, they're trying to do it. Say yes. Say yes. Oh. They're, they're, they're trying to do it, but it's natural for black folk. Y'all know how we do that. That's us people. Yeah. Mm. Most Africans found their spiritual needs were best met in secret. Yes, yes. That's deep, because it still happens today. Yes. They would gather in hush arbors and pray, what they call praying grounds. Uh -huh. That's what they call them back in slavery uh -huh. times. Yes. See, we don't know what praying grounds are today. Uh -huh. One place that there ought to be a praying ground is in your home. Y'all yes. yes. hear what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. In the safety of the wee hours of the morning, they would 
go and gather and express themselves freely and interpret their faith as they saw fit. As black African slaves had the opportunity to develop their own styles of preaching and singing, they did so. Now check this out. I'm going to teach y'all a song today. I'm going to teach you a song that they sang during slavery period to show you how our people dealt with it. See, that, that the preacher back at that time, he might have been an uneducated man, but his preaching was far from being an uneducated message. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, the preacher back then knew all he needed to know. He heard the biblical message of salvation and he heard about a savior who lived in the believer's heart. The slaves were highly critical in these settings of white preachers that tried to keep them in their place. So they would preach on stealing. In other words, the, slave, the black preacher who was liberated in his head he tell them it's all right to steal. Sure. See, we don't hear that today. He would tell them, Brother Evans, it's all right to steal some of that meat. If y'all are hungry. He knew that if they're demonic enough to do all this to us and still be all right with God, then God ought to understand if we steal that pork chop <laughs> to feed our hungry belly. That, I'm, I'm serious. That's the kind of message that he preached. Self-serving. In other words, to hide the greater evil. Check this out. I want to show you how they dealt with pain. Now, let's take a few minutes. You may want to write these words down because y'all going to have to sing them back to me. Everybody say, they give us the corn. They give us the corn. That, I'm, that's how this works. They, they D-E-Y, which meant supposed to be they, right? Give, G-I-B, which is supposed to be give us the corn. So everybody say, they give us the corn. They give us the corn. Everybody say, they give us the crust. They give us the crust. They give us the husk. They give us the skin. They take us in. They give us the liquor. And that's, they say that's good enough for the nigga. Now, let me show you how, let me show you how they sang this. See, in other words, here was the discussion. Follow the discussion now because these slaves are angry. These slaves are upset. And they be out saying, we raise the wheat and they give us the corn. We bake the bread and they give us the crust. We sift the meal and they give us the husk. We peel the meat and they give us the skin. And that's the way they took us in. We skim the pot and they give us the liquor. And they say that's good enough for the nigga. Now do you see the anger in that? So you know what our people would do? I told you last week it was called creative resistance. They take that anger and put it in a song. Now I'm going to sing it for you. Because it would go like this. We raise the wheat, they give us the corn. We bake the bread, they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the husk. We peel the meat, they give us the skin. And that's the way they take the sin. We skim the pot, they give us the liquor. And they say that's good enough for the nigga. Get the idea? Now, y'all got the words I gave you? I'm going to show you how black power gets in a song. I'm going to say the first line. You give me the response. What's the first line? They give us what? Oh. 
They give us the corn. All you keep saying is they give us. First one is corn. Second one is crust. Third one is hus. Skin. skin. And that's the way you say they take us in. I say we skim the pot. What do you say? They give us the liquor. And they say that's good enough for the nigga. All right. So let's. Ready? We raise the wheat. They give us the corn. We bake the bread. They give us the crust. We sift the meal. They give us the husk. We peel the meat. They give us the skin. And that's the way they give us the skin. We skim the pot. They give us the bread. And they say that's good enough for the nigga. Now, let me tell y'all something. See y'all sitting there tomorrow. <laughs> y'all get what I'm saying? Look, y'all got it now? All right, now this, come on, let's, 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 I mean, let's, see, we didn't have instruments, so it was only rhythm. Get the idea? They said, right, come on. We raise the wheat, they give us the car. Say the situational ethics. Yeah, buddy. Mm -mm. African slaves did not accept their condition. They did what they had to do to get through their condition. They developed a strategy. And what was that strategy? That strategy was making it seem like the white man's program was taking root in them. Yeah, they didn't accept slavery, but they did do what they had to do to get through it. The slaves' religions dealt with life as they lived it. In acting or acting out, white evangelicalism took root among the Africans and many African slaves went, underwent conversion and baptism. They went to class, instruction, and worship, and even lived the life of a Christian, even in the face of oppression. Because the psychology was, if I can make Masa think that he's making me what he want me to be, then he'll get up off my back. You understand what I'm saying? Now, how does that hurt us today? Everybody say, a strategy misperceived. A strategy misperceived. You see, brothers and sisters, a strategy, as Dr. Clark says, is something to be used at the time. A strategy should never become a way of life. You understand what I'm saying? Throughout life, you need to develop strategies to address whatever you're dealing with at the time. But don't think that this strategy that my great-grandparents used was to be a way of life for all Africans. Let me explain what I'm talking about. 
as a result of taking on the appearance of being a good Christian, the grandchildren really became that. You understand what I'm saying? When the slave would say, steal away to Jesus, I ain't got long to stay here. Y'all heard that song, haven't you? They wasn't talking about stealing away to some European figure. But see, they said that because if they said Jesus, the slave master would say, we're transforming them. But they were letting you know in the code, I ain't got long to stay here. In other words, we getting up out of here as soon as we can. But the grandchildren who listen to those songs being sung began to take it for real. And as a result, we today Africans have been deracinated. Deracinated means to be pulled up by your roots. We have been uprooted and resulting in an eradication of a spirituality that once existed with us as a people. We have misperceived the strategy of our ancestors and our great grandparents and grandparents and we, we have assisted our oppressor in the manipulation of our own African consciousness. Y'all with me? We have forgotten that history is his story. Let me say that again for you. We have forgotten that history is his story. And brothers and sisters, don't you ever forget that his story was written by powerful people who were more interested in their agenda than in the truth. The mind of our African ancestors were constantly involved in a revolutionary drive to achieve liberation from the subjugation of racism. Mm, mm, mm. But our misperception of their strategy has caused us, their children, to bring shame upon their memory and their wisdom. You see, brothers and sisters, our great grandparents, their strength came from the hope and expectation of escaping the lies that were taught to them by their white racist oppressors. That's what gave them energy to go to the next day. I'm not going to listen to this mess no more after a while. Now, that's what our ancestors did, but now today, we stand on the lies. You hear what I'm saying? Now, today, now our ancestors were looking forward to escaping those lies. Now we will defend those lies. Oh, Lord, have mercy. As a result, we have become the major contributor in putting invisible chains around our own neck. You see, brothers and sisters, the principal function of the invisible chain of Eurocentric religious and philosophical thought is to first separate us from the reality of ourselves. They don't want you to know about melanin in you. They don't want you to understand the power of your genes, black man and black woman. In fact, they'll tell you that's not even important. They don't want you to understand that there's nothing that you cannot do if you put your mind to it, black woman. They don't want you to understand that. They don't want you to even think about the future. They don't want you to plan for your tomorrow. 
and to help you to avoid planning a future, they tell you that Jesus is soon to come. Y'all better catch this thing. See, if the Lord is coming back at any moment, God bless him all. If the Lord is coming back at any moment, then what you getting ready to go to college for? Think. Now they're telling you that. They don't believe that. And I tell you, that whole lot of church folk don't believe that either. They say they do, but I know they don't. Because if you really believe that Jesus was coming back any moment, you wouldn't be building that big church out there. I better get up off that one. You don't really believe that. If you really believed that Jesus was coming back any moment, then why are you putting so much energy into what you're going to do 15 years from now? Now, I don't mind. I'm, I'm not saying don't plan. What I'm saying is stop believing that lie. And go ahead and start thinking about your future, young people. Why do you think the pregnancy rate is so high among young black girls in the church? They sit up in church and all they hear is that there is no tomorrow. Tomorrow is canceled. So if tomorrow is canceled, why work toward it? So the, the subliminal message to the youth is you better do all that you can here while you can now. So that's why our young people are living like there is no tomorrow. One of the most powerful invisible chains that keeps us in bondage is the chain of amnesia. Everybody say amnesia. amnesia. Brothers and sisters, we're guilty of social amnesia. Yeah. Oh yes we are. Yeah. We are guilty of cultural amnesia. Yeah. 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 We are guilty of spiritual amnesia. Uh -huh. We've made our own history unconscious to ourselves uh -huh. by selective amnesia. Now what do I mean by selective amnesia? In other words, you have specifically and intentionally chosen what you want to forget. Uh -huh. Isn't that deep? Yes, yes. You have chosen not to know where you came from. You've chosen not to know of the greatness that's in your melaninated self. You've chosen not to know that. You can go out here and learn everything that they tell you to learn. But when it comes time to learning what you need to learn, to empower yourself as a black man and black woman, you know what you say? Oh, that's not important. Oh. See, you gotta understand, brothers and sisters, when you have an unconscious history, that becomes the source of an unconscious lack of motivation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why we behave the way we do. I've never seen so many young people that are straight up lazy. Yeah. 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 Straight up lazy. Yeah. Ain't trying to do better. Yeah. Woo! Okay, let me move on. I heard somebody saying, all right, pastor, get up off us now. <laughs> We're confused, brothers and sisters, by our own behavior. Yes, yes. How many, you know, it's really deep when a parent can, can talk to another parent and both of them say to each other, child, I don't understand my child. What you mean you don't understand your child? That person came out of your body. What happened with to cause such a disconnect in whatever it is that you're not even the parent anymore. You want to know why we behave the way we do? Then you need to understand his story and understand the effects of his story upon us as a people. The other day I went to see one of the most, one of the worst movies 
I've ever seen in my life. See, a lot of times, people, I go see this stuff so I can rap to y'all about it. Because, see, if I don't know what's going on, I'm not going to be too effective up here. And I went to see this movie. I couldn't believe it. I got so angry. After about 20 minutes into the movie, I had to make myself sit there and watch the rest of it. It's called Baby Boy. I actually got furious because the entire movie is nothing but a portrayal of no good black folk. Not, not one male in that movie had any get up and go about himself. And every woman in the movie was weak. That's the kind of, and you know what's deep about it? The, the movie was jam packed with, with our folk. Brothers sitting there talking about, yeah, hey, yo, go, man, yeah, yeah, bro, that's right, bro. I wanted to smack him in the back of the head. I want to say, pop! <laughs> Sisters, please wake up. Brothers, please wake up. Because we as a people, misperceived the strategy of the situational ethic of our great-grandparents who were slaves. Because we have misperceived the strategy and made it a reality, the would-be African spiritual warrior has vanished deep within the Negro Christian. We have wholeheartedly accepted the Eurocentric idea of religious thought and we're still not saved as a people. Taryn sings a song, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, Lord, I'll go. If the Lord wants somebody, here am I. Send me. We sang last Sunday, Lord, take my life. Use yes. me in your service. Yes. Make, make me and mold me and yes. fashion my life. Yes. For I want to be what you want me to be. Yes. Do you really mean stuff like that, people? Because if you say, God, I want to be what you want me to be, a whole lot of folk going to be angry with you. Yes. 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 You know why? Because you can't be what God wants you to be and what they want you to be at the same time. You can't do it. And if you decide to be used of God, you may have to stand alone. You decide to be used of God, doggone it, hell yes, you're going to be talked about. You're going to be lied on. You're going to be misunderstood. But that's all right. Now, why is it all right? Because the paycheck, good God Almighty, that I'm going to get from God will be worth every lie you told on me. The paycheck that we get from God will be worth being misunderstood. Good Lord, have mercy. I would rather please God. I'm trying to pause because I don't want to say it the way it's in my head. I would rather please God and have you angry with me than to try to please you and you can't even help buy me an ice cream cone. You don't have a heaven, a hell, or even an apartment to put me in. You hear what I'm saying? It don't matter what you think. Is what does God say? See, brothers and sisters, now I didn't just get that. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking like this because I've been through the storm. I've been, I got scars, emotional scars, spiritual scars on my back of where folk who tried to act like they was for you stab you in the back. Have I got a witness here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Even though they stab you in the back, man, it don't matter. Because if God say live, good God Almighty, the devil can say die. 
And the more the devil say die, the more alive you become. Yeah. Woo, good Lord have mercy. Mm. Come on, come on. I'll go. Yeah. And what is the message now? To resurrect and raise up our people. Yes. Yes. To heal our people. Yes. We got work to do. If you're interested in including Dr. Hagens as your next keynote speaker or guest lecturer, just give us a call at the number you see on your screen, or you may write us at the address that you see on our screen. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Hotel.